Hello. Hello, hello. Hello, everyone. Hello. 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 So let's hope for today we'll get more people. Hello. Okay. Is Wonka. Long time haven't chatted. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi. I don't know. Will it hear us? Looks like Ronald has some issues with audio. Seems so. I hope he can hear us. Hey, sorry, my internet is acting up a little bit. Hey, good morning. No problem. Good morning, everyone. Um, maybe we should start. Um, all right, so welcome everyone to today's uh, CDI meeting. We are the 23rd of February. Uh, on the agenda, we have the following topics. Um, the logo, um, the first draft implementation, and a demo. Are there any other items people want, would like to add to the agenda? Well, we added also this, uh, remember this old topic about non-root uh, containers and usage of the devices. So we, we just need to agree about a few next steps. Okay. Um, logo and draft implementation, I'm just gonna skip over them. Basically, please go look at the slides and give us feedback 
Um, feedback can be done either through Slack, over the slides, or just as an email to this um, to the to the to to Segrenta, uh, as an answer to to the email that I sent. Uh, the draft of implementation. Um, there's nothing new here. Just please take a quick stab at, at, at reviewing it. Uh, it'll unblock Podman implementation, um, and that's it. Alexander, do you want to bring up your so, topics? Uh, wait a second. So regarding the first implementation, so it's uh, your your reference is just to a part of CDI, like CDI part, but uh, have you already published it with Podman pull request or? If you create something no, else for because um, uh, I mean, we we have a small Podman implementation that I showed like um, last time, uh, but I didn't make a pull request because it relies on um, the pull request that is for CDI to be actually merged. Okay. Just to get the wiring rights, you know, about the import path. So, Runo, uh, next question regarding the demo. So, we have almost the same set of people what we had in past time. Uh, do you know if, uh, let's say, Kevin from your side is going to join? I know what Manal has. Uh, Kevin, was a, Kevin, unfortunately, couldn't join. Um, and But he'll be able to join next time. Um, and I think um, we will... Uh, Renal needed to can't join the, these meetings anymore. Uh, he has a standing conflict. Uh, so uh, we might no, need to reschedule. With I spoke with Renal a couple of days ago, yeah. and he wanted to rejoin the meetings because it's getting now concrete and the implementations on Podman and Cryo. So uh, I think next time he will join. But uh, let's see. Sounds good. Um, I mean, it's no, no. that's, that's one more person than last time. I'm, I'm just thinking like, do, do we have, uh, I mean, does it make sense uh, to, to repeat them or just use the previous recording? What do you feel? I mean, if if you don't uh, like, it's it's okay to to not redo the demo. We can we can always like point to the recording. I think it's on YouTube. Uh, well, I, I'm I'm just curious uh, how much people are interested to see it because like or uh, Okay, well let, let me ask differently. Like Zvonka and Rodney, uh, you are two new people who previously haven't seen what demo. Uh, do you want to look at it and a description about it, or you want to look at it offline in a recording? Both both ways for us work fine. Both ways for me work as well. If if we have time, I I would love to see the demo. Okay, uh, one, one, let's do I mean, it. It needs to be a quorum. So if other people are not interested in it, I can take it offline. Hi, I'm interested on in seeing the demo too. Yeah. Okay, well, let's let's do it. All right, so let let me switch. Share the screen. This one. Do you see it? Yes. All right, so uh, how we structure, I think. Uh, I will do some introduction words, just explain the basic idea, what we are trying to achieve. And uh, afterwards, we will see two parts of a demo. Like Ed will show how it works for FPGAs and Ducre is going to show it how it works for uh, GPUs. So first of all, we are talking about how to use the CDI. So right now, in, uh, the CDI is, uh, on the level, what uh, how we describe the devices uh, in a form what it can be 
uh, consumed by the runtimes and attached to the containers. Uh, what we want to show is a step further. So how uh, it potentially can be used uh, in Kubernetes world. So the, oops, oops. So where the main idea is what we want to get to is to have uh, CRD objects, which will be described in uh, uh, devices. And well, CRD object is something what port can consume. So uh, using or exposing devices as CRD objects gives us a lot of freedom of how devices are allocated, how devices like life cycle is managed and, and so on. So we have preliminary idea of how it maps to a few objects. And let me walk through from one. So first of all, we have idea of a device class. So this kind of objects will contain information about uh, the vendor, like set of devices which are compatible. So for example, like several generations of GPUs can be the same or like, uh, several FPGA cards might be uh, compatible with multiple functions. So this part contains the information, what is the common parameters, what is the vendor specific provisioner or controller, which uh, handles these types of devices in the cluster. When we have device claim, so practically this is how the workload says, I want to use particular device. And inside that uh, object, what we want to have is a set of parameters exactly describing what actually, what kind of device user wants. So for example, like it can say, I want to have device from the class uh, FPGA or GPU, but when it can provide a set of parameters, like I want this particular amount of uh, memory on that on with device. Uh, I want time slice if it supports the sharing and Yada yada. Um, based on the devices, it might be a lot of different parameters. So when we have a controller which actually handles this claim, and based on this claim parameters, it, it does uh, it creates an object or this actual device allocation. So uh, this actual device allocation contains information, like actual information about the. Uh, device which can be consumed by the workload. So practically it's a, a part of the JSON file what needs to be created for CDI to be consumed, but as well uh, topological information for uh, Kubernetes, for example, like on which nodes it, it can be available um, if some additional information needed to be exposed for Kubernetes as well. And when this going to be consumed by the port. So as I mentioned, the JSON file, which is created from device allocation, it will be using the standard, uh, well, <laughs> by our proposed CGI interface uh, as part of uh, one or multiple com containers within the pod. So to demonstrate all of this concept, we didn't want to re-implement everything from scratch. What, uh, what we thought is what, the current uh, Kubernetes CSI components, we have all the needed components, which we can, I would say, misuse to demonstrate this kind of concept. So we are picking back on uh, CSI, like controller and node agents, uh, persistent to demonstrate uh, well, like simple device allocation and ephemeral storage uh, primitives, uh, if we want, when we want to demonstrate like uh, a bit more complex like deployments with multiple ports where uh, you have it like template and where every port is actually allocating uh, similar kind of devices for, for the workloads. So on what step I'll hand over it to Ed who can show actual, actual thing. Hi everyone. I'm Ed Bartosz uh, and I'm going to to continue with the demo but before the demo I would like to uh, let me share my screen I would like to show 
kind of um, allocation workflow diagram. So it uh, let's start from the CDI components. So the the CDI uh, actually uh, contains uh, two main components: the controller and node agent. The controller usually runs on master, and node agents they are uh, responsible for collecting device information. So they they need to access the devices, and so they they are running on the nodes. Um, <clears throat> And then uh, this is actually implemented as a CSI plugin. So it, it has like similar components. So we are, as Sasha said, we are picking back on, on CSI implementation. So we, di we didn't uh, touch the control plane components like scheduling and so on. We just implemented it as a CSI driver. Uh, so on the uh, workflow, uh, we have this storage class, which uh, describes uh, the uh, the device uh, device type, the device family, if you wish. Uh, then we have this persistent volume claim, which is kind of device claim. So it has uh, specific allocation uh, parameters. They are passed as a PVC annotations. Uh, so when the pod uh, is created, it's uh, it's referencing PVC and PVC is referencing storage class. So on the pod creation time, we have all the information like from from storage class and from PVC and and from pod of course. Uh, and that actually pod creation uh, triggers uh, two CSI uh, calls. First is a create volume, so it comes to uh, to main CSI controller uh, and controller at, at that time it, it has all the information about all the devices in the cluster because uh, node agents actually provided this information to it. So it has uh, all the information to to understand which node can satisfy the the parameters the uh, like the end parameters again they are coming from storage class pvc and pod so it it picks up the uh, the node contacts the csi uh, cdi node agent and, and cdi node agent uh, actually makes necessary steps to uh, to mark the device as an as allocated and uh, like when when pod uh, finishes, then uh, the so the allocation request actually the it's uh, uh, it, it's uh, it's going like the same way as as allocation, just other way around. So and the next call, which is also called uh, when the the pod uh, the pod creation is actually started, is node stage volume. So in CSI world, it's uh, the aim of this call is to uh, mount uh, the volume on the on the node, and then it can be been been mounted uh, bound been mounted into the the pods. Uh, files uh, file systems like when the when the pod is created so that happens before the pod is created and that is that call is handled by csi node agents so what what it does it's basically it has an information about the device they allocated and it just creates the cdi json file on the node file system uh, by the way we are using like cdi spec uh, well, at least that, that part about the devices. So and this file contains the information about the devices first, and then about these parameters. And parameters can be passed uh, as, a, uh, as environment, for example, and environment variables like to the container. And then we have this run C wrapper. Uh, it, uh, when it's called, like I, I actually omitted all this, uh, 
uh, CRI things because it's it's uh, it doesn't matter in in this picture. So like at the end of the day, run C is called, and it's uh, reading this JSON file, reading the information about the devices that that uh, should be accessible inside container. Does uh, it it actually updates the the spec the uh, sets uh, devices there like uh, and sets environment variables and uh, and then like it creates the container the run scene not a wrapper so a wrapper is just to read the CSI JSON and update the spec and the run C creates the container and container has the access to the device and it has access to the environment variables uh which are coming from from parameters so that's that's the the picture at least how i can see it uh if you if you have any questions you you can ask uh along the way so in the next step i i will try to to demonstrate it with the fpga devices how the allocation works and um and it's like very simple demo. The, the next part would be like more uh, complex demo. And, and, and this one is just like simple, uh, as simple as I could come up with. So it's screencasted. So I just run a screencast. So we have um, two nodes um, with uh, actually control plane ports running and we have uh, this CDI controller running and CDI node. So if we have uh, more nodes then like more uh, CDI node uh, components would be running here. And then we have uh, two devices on, on, the, on the node, two FPGA devices. So the first one, um, so I would like to, to point out to these two parameters. So first one is interface ID. It actually describes the device class. In this case, it's uh, area 10 FPGA device. And accelerator ID is uh, basically the function which is programmed into the device currently. So it's programmed, uh, programmed device, so that can be changed. Like the, this one also can be changed if you like upgrade the firmware and stuff like that. But we consider it as a kind of uh, constant for the current device class. So, and we have another device. Uh, which is basically the same device, uh, but uh, uh, as you can notice, the the function is different. So it's it's programmed with different functions. And what we actually want uh, when we like specify uh, that 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 we want device, we want some accelerator function. So for example, like JZip or whatever, like some compression, uh, another compression algorithm. So that is specified by this ID. And that, that uh, like this ID, we, we will be using actually in the, in the PVC, we'll be using this ID. So we are expecting this uh, uh, first device to be allocated and accessible inside the container and and this device like wouldn't fit the the, the parameters because we want this accelerator function <clears throat> so uh, let's start from like creating storage class so as i said it's uh, is describing uh, the device family so in this case like device family area 10 uh, and it has this uh, interface ID parameter, so uh, which is common for both our devices. So we, we create the class. Next step, uh, we will create a persistent volume claim. So it's uh, considered as a kind of device uh, device request. Mm. And uh, just creating the claim doesn't actually trigger uh, any device allocation because we don't have pod yet. So as soon as we have pod that, that is referencing this PVC, the 
the volume or device in our case, uh, like volume allocation request or device allocation request would would be actually created and processed by the CSI machinery. So we created PVC. And uh, next step, we will create a pod. So let's look at the pod, how it's referencing. So as, as we are using CSI, uh, we have to use like this mount, pass, and uh, volumes uh, thing. And the, uh, the way how it's referencing uh, the PVC is through this persistent volume claim parameter. We create a pod. Then everything goes as I tried to describe on the picture. And then we, we can just check if the device, uh, the first device, like which ends to zero, uh, is accessible inside the container. It is. So that's that's practically the demo. So again, we had, uh, let me switch back to this. So we had uh, one parameters uh, passed from storage class parameters, and we had another parameters, the, the function ID passed as an annotation, like through these calls. And in the end, uh, we had this device accessible inside this container. So that's, that's it. And uh, next demo is, will be uh, showed by, by Ukri. Thanks. And, and just small comment. So yeah. just because we are using the CSI for, for this demonstration, like some of the parameters are passed as annotations, but the end goal is to use like the proper CRDs so we can have a, a custom fields what vendors can specify based on their uh, device requests or device needs. Okay, my turn. Yeah. Uh, I hope you can see it. Um, so this is the same thing that I presented uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, I took the uh, CDI thing to a GPU context and uh, basically I was interested more in figuring out how it could improve on, let's say, sharing of GPUs and things like that, getting like multiple ports running and a bigger deployment and how it works in situations like that. So uh, instead of trying to exactly match uh, a device like Ed showed, uh, I uh, created resources for the GPU, uh, like memory and millicores, uh, which uh, which could be consumed by pods, sort of dynamically until they run out, and see if I could do this uh, in addition to this sort of exact matching of allocations. And um, uh, in this demo, we've got more nodes. There are uh, basically three nodes. We got CFL, Nucky, Nux, two of them small uh, nodes with one GPU each. And we have a CMLS machine over there, which has two GPUs. You can see also one machine up at the top, which is running the CDI controller pod, but it could be any machine in the cluster, really. Typically the master, like Ed said, but anyway, in this case, it's not. So the, um, the cards in these, if we look at the device files in the nodes through SSH are here. And uh, like I said, the NUX only have one GPU in them, but the CMLS machine has two, two GPU cards. And um, for these uh, GPUs, uh, there is no, um, there isn't a proper proper uh, memory query or you know figuring out of the capabilities I instead just hard coded those things and I created two resources named memory and millicores so each GPU gets 1000 millicores and basically four gigabytes of memory 
through the hard coding instead of figuring out the capabilities. And these are then just, you know, then moved into map, a map of parameters. By the way, if you're interested in, in the demo code, go there. But let's go back to the actual demo. Um, at the bottom left corner, uh, you can see a deployment YAML. Now, since the cluster has four GPUs with four gigabytes of RAM each, uh, that's a total of 16. And uh, uh, we've got a deployment here with 10 replicas, each trying to get 1.5 gigs. So that's 15 in total, which you know, from a number point of view, it should fit. But if you look at the GPUs having four gigabytes each, uh, you could basically only fit two ports for each GPU. And that means that four GPUs uh, equals eight ports that should get up running. Uh, the millicore amount here, since each GPU has 1000, shouldn't be a limiting factor as much as the memory. And uh, we're using ephemeral uh, volumes here, uh, just because if we didn't, we wouldn't be getting individual volumes created for each port. This is a uh, little drawback of using the CSI. So um, the expected end result when I launch this deployment is that we get eight ports running and two of them should end up pending uh, if the resource management works. So let's see. And it seems that it is still working. <clears throat> and also the expectation is that since the CMLS1 machine has the two cards, it should be running more ports. And we can see that we should have four ports running in there. And that's correct. And these NUCs only have two ports. So everything seems to be fine. Uh, there's still one check we can do. Let's see. We can check what kind of a device has got mounted into these um, ports. And again, the expectation is that we should see only two uh, ports using the card number one. Uh, so we have J4LHQ, uh, which is over here. And it should be the two card machine, and it is. And there's another one over here, which is LX4GV. So that should also be CMLS. And that's correct. So it kind of works as long as you don't try to allocate more than one GPU. That's basically the place where we have a little bit of issues using the storage. Because if you try to allocate to they don't get allocated and considered at the same time, and that creates issues then. Um, now, if I would try to add an, another deployment there, it should end up pending. And if I then delete the first one, which may take some time, the one that was pending should eventually end up running again. So it's like this. Basically, any kind of uh, params could be created, but now we cho chose to do memory and milli cores in this sort of dynamic fashion. I got a question. Um, how do you test this? I mean, um, Let's say that you have an application that requires some CUDA access to the library. Um, how do you expose the content of those drivers inside your container? I'm sorry, inside your pod in this case, so that they can reach and make, um, you know, they make use of that uh, library that um, makes use of in a specific um, hardware. Um, I mean, how do you test that? That's basically the question I'm asking. Well, I would like to direct any CUDA-related questions towards NVIDIA, really. 
if Reno can fill in how they do it, but we try to, in Intel, we try to do our stuff in upstream and, and okay. basically. No, I mean, it's not specifically to CUDA, I guess that what I'm asking is, um, this framework that you guys are thinking about um, has to take into account the fact that there are some sources, some code, some libraries that might need to be imported, you know, or exported um, into the pods. Um, and uh, I'm just, I, I'm just saying that we have to think about that and how is that going to be, um, you know, done um, within the context of this framework. Let, let me answer it. So, uh, in, in general. Uh, like importing, well, adding anything to the container, it's possible. Like the CDI specs uh, allows you to add any new mounts to a container or any, uh, let's say, press start hooks. So for example, how NVIDIA does it is what uh, uh, inside CDI is a JSON file, it will be injected information about like LD config scripts and CUDA libraries. Uh, it's it's of course like certainly separate questions like should it be done or not but it's it's for fact of life and yes it, it might it might be that way so the idea is what this json file for cdi is created by vendor specific node agent so it will be like similarly to csi drivers you have uh, two components which each vendor needs to provide the controller which holds the like the custom vendor logic about the uh, whole cluster allocation. And then the node agent, uh, again, vendor specific code, which transforms the allocation object to actual uh, CDI JSON. So if any vendor have some specifics, for example, like with library injections, then it will be on the node component, which with bits will be injected. Make sense? Yeah, yes, it does. It answers the question. Thank you. Right. And from my side, this is mostly what I had to demonstrate. Uh, we didn't get much further than this for the time being uh, with the storage as our tool. So I yeah. suppose I'll stop sharing here. Yeah, and again, storage is just a show to show the concept. The, the final idea how it should end up is what uh, we are considering to use for CRDs, uh, and when we need to come up with a way how those CRDs can be specified and report as a consumable resource. So, on that note, I will stop. Zvonka, awesome, thank you very much for the demo. I just wanted to ask Zvonka if you have any feedback yeah, or yes. impression. Um, I need to digest some things, but my, my first thought was uh, every, every GPU vendor will implement sharing in another way. Uh, AMD with C groups, uh, NVIDIA with MIG, uh, I don't know how Intel is, is partitioning their GPU. So in the in the last screenshot, you, you you are requesting resources via melee cores and memory. Are we going to talk about an interface, how we are going want to uh, request those resources? I mean, melee cores could be the right term, but uh, most of the GPUs have like CU units or compute units. Uh, are we going to do a abstracted interface for requesting those resources? Um, it could be GPU could implement sharing with time sharing or uh, the amount of CUs it provides. Uh, so this would be my, my question. How are we going to talk about the interface, how to request the resources? So Ukri can talk about that in more details, but my generic answer to that uh, will be such. So you are correct. So uh, all vendors might have different uh, variants how to control the additional parameters of the devices. <clears throat> so luckily for GPU, at least in upstream kernel, uh, there is a discussion going on what uh, like 
like at least like where upstream kernel drivers will have the same unified uh, C groups interface to consume or to specify those resources. It's a long question when it will be merged to upstream kernel and when it will be stabilized, but at least like some intermediate patches exist and um, at least on our side, we are, we are testing these values. Uh, however, for, for different classes of web devices, for example, um, FPG, I hardly believe what it will be some standard interface through the C groups or through the kernel. So it, we might end up in with scenarios what in some pre-start hooks or pre-create hooks, uh, like some of the parameters for the device will be handled in, in this uh, like scripts which is executed before the container is actually started. Um, so, for example, like we are, we are handling the programming of a device through through those, but for for our type of software devices, it might be some other vendor specific logics. So, the whole idea is what we are trying to provide a mechanism where, first of all, the user experience will have the ability to specify all kind of parameters which required for vendor and for particular device type. And when we have a whole pipeline to deliver those uh, parameters down to a point where it can be actually consumed and put into, into use, for example, like true kernel drivers or through any other mechanisms. Because practically if you think about it, so the same concept might work for devices over the fabric. So you just need to provide these uh, parameters to the fabric controller to repair devices based on where, uh, these parameters and where those needs. Yeah, the parameters shown in this demo uh, were just examples and there was no intention at all trying to uh, force them down anybody's throat. Uh, so we tried to make this demo at the moment able to use any kind of parameter names. Uh, so there's really no limit there what they could be. Uh, it's an interesting thought to actually try to unify some of those uh, for GPUs. But mm. uh, well, at least I did, didn't have any kind of a intention towards that at the moment. But we're open to any kind of discussions, of course. Yeah, yeah. it was clear that this was not like the final stage and you don't want to have melee course for every device there. Uh, but thinking of GPUs, there is some abstraction, as you just said, uh, we could anticipate to have. Uh, but yeah, it, it will not fit for an FPGA. It will not fit for for a, uh, let's say, a NIC or something else. Uh, we cannot say milli course or memory or something like that. that that's completely uh, fair to say. Okay, yeah. And that's why I asked, are we going to think about to add a interface to some specific devices or are we going to leave this completely open? Are we going to make this somehow configurable and the controller will pick it up and manage any of these annotations that we are adding there? So I'm just thinking aloud uh, how to move forward. Okay, great, thanks. Well, my initial idea when, when I initially thought about this is what uh, I, I don't want to limit uh, vendors into a specific like set of parameters or a set of things. So yeah. if you look at the existing CSI layer, uh, we can see what like there is a hard coded set of parameters or set of uh, uh, fields which needs to be filled. So for example, like you need to request the size of something, uh, like regardless what kind of storage it is. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to repeat the same scenario here. Well, the idea of using CRD is it would like it, it should be like really specific controller to to this CRDs to actually process the schema, process the parameters, and then just say, okay, allocation is here, and this is the point of the object which handles the allocation. And node agent on the node knows how to handle that object and expand it to the uh, CDI JSON. So that way uh, we can have like any kind of parameters. So for example, like imagine we can say, uh, let's say network device added. So we can pass when uh, like list of VLANs which needs to be pre-created for, for yep. those devices and when exposed. 
or, or, or something like very, let's say, uh, we can have like optional devices. So we can have uh, devices which can say, okay, we can be shared within one node, but we, we shouldn't be shared between multiple nodes. Or we can be shared within one port, but not within multiple containers. Like this kind of um, uh, like flexibility of how, how it can be expanded. Um, so well, the goal is like to, to, to give a flexibility and give a, a flexible interface what uh, vendor logic can handle allocation, not only within one small piece of node, but also across the cluster. So multiple uh, devices over the fabric uh, scenarios. Uh, and when uh, flexibility of uh, what kind of resources it can be consumed within the pod. So scheduler knows what it's accessible and how yeah. it's handled, it's handled by runtime. Okay. Uh, makes complete sense. That's why I also mentioned that every vendor will have like uh, their own way of sharing and we need to adapt it to, to their needs and not uh, lock them down in any, anything. Uh, the, the, the plan going forward is, is to, is it to extend then device manager and device plugin to resemble this, this functionality you, you created here, or do you want to create a complete new instance running, running Kubernetes? like I own CDA agent and the CDI node thing? So I don't believe what uh, existing device manager as, as it's implemented right now, uh, it will be capable to, let's say step-by-step step to, to do migration. Mm -hmm. what, what I'm thinking is actually to create uh, similar to CSI part inside Kublet the mechanism, well, actually it's not only Kublet, it's, it, it will touch across the whole stack things. So first of all, we need to have in pod spec a mechanism to reference to uh, CRD as a consumable resource per container uh, or as a pod resource. Actually, it, it, it's both valid cases. Second thing uh, we will need to have on the scheduler part, uh, like similar um, pieces of algorithm, which says uh, like 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 currently scheduler is handling the storage, so the the, the pod is not scheduled to the node until we actually get the claim uh, fulfilled, and when we have actual allocation with topology information where uh, this volume is existing. So when the scheduler makes the decision to to place the pod. So here we, we will have the same thing. So the scheduler should wait for when this allocation will be fulfilled and afterwards it, uh, it will schedule to, to appropriate node where this allocation is available. And when for the kubelet, so the kubelet needs to have similar to CSI uh, mechanism to, to do those few things like publish, prepare, uh, those base, basic things which needs to be done, like the steps before the container is run. Um, and like where devices is the major use case, but in reality, in reality, what we are talking about is actually, uh, it's a primitives what can say, what port can reference uh, as a consumable resource any other CFD object. It might not result as a like actual attached resource to, uh, to, to the container, but it, it might help with just like, say, like scheduling logic or extending um, logic of Kubernetes. So right now CRDs are the things on top of, like the pod is the most smallest thing. When eventually what, what we will, get if we will implement these things what we are showing here is actually the crd will also become a consumable object with input okay thanks i i don't know how, how do you feel is it good idea bad idea <laughs> uh as i said i need to digest 
everything, but but looking at the concept, it looks good to me for now. Uh, need to think about more. And yeah, and as you said, there's definitely the connection to the scheduling uh, topology hints, device manager, uh, device plugins, topology manager, CPU manager, all those connections to be made as well. Uh, so well, um, just to nitpick on, on, on this thing. So uh, right now we have a big problem with topology manager, CPU manager and device manager is what. Uh, way do a decision and that's, yeah. those decisions are not uh, based on the, like how how big problem of migrating of workloads between the comp uh, components. So for example, like making a decision for device is heavy thing. Like you cannot, like if, if you have a device, you cannot move it, it's physically attached. Yeah. But some things like some resources like CPU cores, it's easy. Like it's almost instant migration. Memory, it's a bit more complex. You, you require to move for memory and it's more expensive thing. So, uh, and with all this mechanism, we have a problem what, for example, like existing storage layer, it completely not visible to topology manager. So you might end up mm. what you you have, like, yes, your, uh, your pod is consuming the device and it's efficient, but when you have a storage, which is completely connected to different PCI bus and you are this one workload stressing the whole system. So, um, there are several ways how to do it differently. Uh, I don't want to be, uh, <laughs> well, I don't want to include it in this particular discussion, but uh, if we want to have really efficient resource management, we need to consider also how the storage is handled and when, you know, well, how this resource is allocated to all across the node. So you are involved also in the topology aware scheduling thing. So I suppose you have this CDI use case in mind going forward with all the uh, caps and and uh, that we have for topology aware scheduling, right? We have, but again, in, in, uh, how to say, um, it, <laughs> will, to... It, it, it will be multi-stage things. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. We, we, we can improve like small things right now with the current design, but in very long term, when we will need to revisit some of our decisions. Okay. But yeah. at, 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 at least for like my my way, oh, well, sorry, not my, but our, our ways of thinking about what is uh, currently what like Swati and Alexei uh, are doing uh, is what, we are trying to make it sure what the information exposure to scheduler will be enough to, to make the good decisions. Uh, but uh, as soon as we will start to add, uh, let's say vendor specific logic. So for example, like this NVIDIA MIG, right? So it's a, it's a fabric of interconnected devices. So where let's say inside node topology might become a completely irrelevant when you're building like multi node workloads. So we, we need to have some flexibility how to expose that and how to use it in, in scheduler, but it might be not as trivial as, as this current device plugins and interfaces what we have right now. Yeah, okay, I agree. Okay, we are almost at the top of the hour. Any other things we should discuss before closing this? Yes, we have actually one uh, one more item, which is uh, non-root containers, and it's great what Mike at least joined it. Um, so, Mika, if you want, the stage is yours. Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to follow up this topic. So it's a it's a it's a long topic that we discussed. I think like more than six six months ago. I, I prepared this uh, do document June, July time, time frame. We had uh, some con conversation. I heard some feedback about uh, about the do document, but then it's been mostly silent on what the next steps should be. What I did, I, I think it was like uh, a month ago or so, I, I created 
two POCs based on, on the proposals that I laid out in, in the document and uh, sent a reminder to Signode mailing list about getting feedback. Uh, getting feedback about those, those POCs that I, I built, but I, I got zero feedback to those as well. So on the two, and I have the, the conversation what the, what the next steps uh, should be on, on this. My POC is I, I, I created them based on, or I, I created um, my, my POC using called container D. So if, if Mike is here, would you be kind of really willing to take a look and, and give your feedback what I have? Hey Miko. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take a look. Thanks. Uh, I can I can send you the the, the links. I, I have them maintained in my private uh, GitHub repository. One one thing that I was discussing with Sasha today was that uh, uh, I could also create a pull request uh, for, for the con container D repository. I just uh, re rebased my POC to the latest uh, master today and everything seems, everything seems to be fine. Cool. So would you prefer- You want to update the status then on the, on, on the open issue in Kubernetes in KK? Oh, okay, I, I can do that. I can do that then and uh, yeah, and I'll I'll just follow the link and and yeah, I'll, I'll review your if you want to push that code, that's great. Um, we're a little swamped. <laughs> Which way? So I, I can I can create a pull request to container D repository as well. But right now it I I, I have the the code living in my private fork, and I have the okay. uh, I have. I actually suggest let's create also a pull request to Cryo. So we have like two two pull requests for both major implementations. So we yeah, we want to do the implementation the same way. Yep. So, okay, so I can I can certainly do that. But um, let, let me share uh, kind of the update to this uh, KK issue with with the latest code I have, and I can also uh, submit it as a as a pull request to, to, to container D, container D repository, and then do the kind of the same for for Cryo as well. Yeah, did did uh, yeah? I haven't looked at your document. Did you did you choose? I think I put a couple of options there. I'm not sure if you picked one. I, I to be fair, you know that was June of last year. <laughs> yes, it, yes, it was. It's it was long long time ago, and it was by, kind of the time I was starting my summer vacations, and then when I got back, I right? Yeah, did yeah. Not I, work. <laughs> I've got va a vague memory of reading through it and making some suggestions, but I I don't remember the details. So I'll have to refresh my memory and then uh, and then get back to you. Okay, but yeah, if you'll if you'll put something in there that updates it a little bit, just a reminder. And then I've got it on my screen, of course. But yeah, I'll, and yeah, we could definitely use the help on PRs here. I mean, oh, okay. <laughs> but so we can we we can now kind of keep the con conversation go going, and I'm 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 at least committed to kind of getting this closed, kind of wanting to. To have the problem sorted sorted out so it's uh let's hey guys it sounds, it sounds like you did it both ways i yeah my i have two i have two pocs both both ways are in, implemented our preference is the kind of the opt-out model and the or, original idea that we would use the uh, run as user run as group as as the uh, user id and uh, group id right. the device node yeah, I hate to have to do it on other annotations, but I think that's the only way to get it through cleanly right now until we've moved cryo, I'm sorry, cry to, you know, to pass beta. And, we'll, and when we get to a point one, we'll be able to update the uh, security context fields. But uh, Mike, we, we don't need to update the security context fields for, for this particular change. Right, that, that's correct. That's why I was saying we can just do it as an annotation. Yeah. And uh, well, Mika said what we have two implementation and we experimented with both and uh, I think mm. just- They both work, yeah. you just gotta pick one. All right. Yeah, we both works. Uh, we just want to like with PR, what Mika is going to create it will just include the one which uh, we think more user-friendly and uh, device plugin developer more friendly. Yeah, that's that's fair. I didn't, I didn't really care which direction it was. If you guys want to pick, go ahead. Okay, so, sounds good. 
But I, I'll, to, I'll, I'll post the update to the issue. And uh, there was uh, somebody asking the document. So yeah, it is available as, as the Google Doc link in, in the, the KK issue. So, cool. Thank, thanks, Mikael. Thanks for take, taking, the, taking the lead on this. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for the feedback. All right. So we are top of our hour. Thank you everyone for joining today. Thank you for listening for and watching our demos and asking the questions. Let's continue over the mails and let's chat in two weeks. See you, Alex. Cheers. Thanks. Take Bye. care. Thanks. Bye -bye.